Hi, I'm Reverend Gwen Thomas. I greet you in the name of Jesus, the one who redeemed us, the one who died and rose again on behalf of us. I'd like to thank your pastor for inviting me to share with you for just a few moments. If you would, turn with me in this, to the scripture, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. Again, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. It reads as such. The Lord has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to as those who are taught. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Our topic today, I am a superhero. I am a superhero. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ability to have technology, to have technology bring us together. We ask you to bless us, to be with each of us as we go through this troubling season and bring us out of it, Lord. God, help us to learn today from the word we receive. Help us to draw from it something that will encourage us, that will strengthen us, and that it will help us continue to serve you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Faster than a speeding bullet, stronger than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. When I was growing up, I loved to watch superheroes, you know, the Justice League, Wonder Woman, Underdog. In fact, I used to grab a rope and go outside and pretend that I was Wonder Woman. Wow, wouldn't that be great to have superpowers? You know, not afraid of anything, able to defeat any problem you have, any problem of your loved ones, to take on the suffering of your community. Mm, again, what a fantasy. Today, of course, we have struggles. We have lots of struggles. Even before this pandemic, we as a nation were in trouble. The crimes that the superheroes take on are in our own communities and the government can't agree on a bill or a law. People don't have health insurance. People don't have clean water. The suffering, the list goes on and on, suffering. In today's passage from Isaiah, we hear the musings of a prophet who is seeking to make sense of the painful realities of exile. This scripture helps us to frame such issues as to what is happening with the children of Israel who are, are suffering the lingering effects of exilic life in Babylon. It's an interesting scripture to consider on Palm Sunday, uh, the end of the conclusion of Lent. As introdu an introduction to Holy Week, this text provides Christians with a particular understanding of Jesus, Jesus' journey to resurrection through the cross. And in the middle of an ordinary time, this passage reminds us of the faithful, of the cost of discipleship. The idea of righteous suffering is prevalent to what Jesus did and what Jesus calls us to do. The faithful have the cost of discipleship. There will be times in the Christian life when living into God's calling comes at a price. The protagonist in this text is a nameless servant. Most scholars have identified him as either a particular individual or collective Israel. I believe it is a good example to name our group suffering. What is the meaning of suffering? Of course, different people have different experiences and different circumstances that define suffering for them. The idea that righteous suffering is a 
of is righteous suffering is a common experience for Christians who adhere to the call of Christ. And Jesus gave us a perfect example when he lived as an activist, when he died on our behalf. This passage has two sections, verses four through five and seven through nine, both of which hand on the servants suffering at the hands of his enemies in verse six. The first part of this focuses on the servants calling through the images of speaking and hearing. The center of, a, of the passage is verse six, which depicts the abuse the prophet is experiencing from his images, from his enemies. What is remarkable about this figure is not that he so eloquently describes his suffering. What's remarkable is he, that he can have hope. He expresses hope. It's just remarkable that he can have hope at all. Can you relate to a time when you had little or no hope? that things would change or be improving. Even right now, we have limited hope or even fading hope. When we think about our new normal with this COVID-19. But here's what he brings himself to say, not only because he, not because he sees it, but because he persistently believes it. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. That's the way we should react, to know that God's mercies never come to an end. We must remind ourselves that morning by morning, new mercies we, mercies we see. Great is God's faithfulness, faithfulness to you and to me. What a refreshing thought. So I remind myself that no matter what NPR or CNN or CBS reports, my survival is dependent on the one who holds the world. Yes, there may be costs for being faithful to God's calling. We can equate ourselves with the experience of suffering through the lens of this servant's firsthand experience. But there is also vindication of the servant's uh, obedience. So we consider our divine calling on one hand and the Lord's vindication on the other. Let us emphasize our calling through the theme of faithfulness. Now, I'm mindful that the heavens have endowed me with the ability to let whoever pushes my buttons or causes me suffering have it in every, with every bit of grace and with perfect prose. I pray that this gift is always um, endowed to me. As we as believers grow to understand the ways Jesus fulfilled his role as Messiah and Savior, we can find guidance in how we should respond. As the embodiment of God's word, Jesus suffered greatly for speaking and living out righteousness. He died for righteousness' sake, and we celebrate that he rose for it. Such a stance as the one Jesus took is not adopted easily. Ambiguous realities still persist. Throughout our history, many turning points have presented themselves, many ambiguous moments at which decisions have been made to choose trust. In every instance, some individuals or communities have found themselves unable or unwilling to adopt the role, the role presented here. And in many times, more than we can know, some have trusted God through the midst of terrible darkness. Despite distress and opposition, they maintain their integrity. Trust God. Know that God will be your advocate. And just as we read about this servant and read about the suffering and integrity of Jesus, we see in Jesus an example, a pattern for ourselves. This composer wrote this passage uh, in hope of uniting scattered Judah once again in Jerusalem and inspiring fellow, fellow Israelites to rebuild the city destroyed decades before. We can use this as we, th as we think of the uncharted uncharte territory in our own lives. Fateful roads often proceed through dark places and require study, sturdy trust. They sometimes require 
require resistance to wrongful accusations and always commend respect and advocacy for those who are wrongly harmed. That is what God requires of us, that we take a stand, a stand in hope of in God's justice and mercy, a hope that shapes those who hold it morning by morning into faithful servants of God. God sees injustice and exercises compassion. The appropriate human stance before God is to lift up hearts and hands. God seeks resolution neither in understanding nor in outcome. God simply prescribes a response, a stance of creaturely hope that God's goodness will in the end prevail, a stance of sturdy enough hope, hope sturdy enough to withstand affliction, a stance that maintains integrity without defensiveness and humility without abjectness. A new and creative response to suffering must emerge from us. A response that does not explain or justify, but simply endures with hope. Without such expressions, Judaism would not have survived and Christianity would never have been born. So when we walk in darkness without light, we can envision a stance of trust despite confusion, despite opposition, despite our present trials. And as God's servants, we can share this hope with others, beckoning them to endure with hope, endure with hope, and through their endurance to become God's light to the nations. Over and over, we learn that the, the suffering and the things we have endured have meaning and that our lives have a future. And we have the same great responsibility to offer that to others in the world. But there are things we must count on to maintain the hope and trust we need. First, we must have an open ear. God opens the servant's ear to prepare him to learn and to speak. This is an ongoing process that now, rather than a one-time experience. God wakens the servant's ear morning by morning. In similar fashion, we need to be alert to the ways that God speaks to us day by day. God opens the servant's ears and gives him words to share. But the servant chooses how he will react to the word. Now he says uh, he will, he, he, he's obedient to speak it. Now he says, and he accepts, and he doesn't turn away from God's instruction. This implies that the word is challenging and even threatening. Isn't it ironic that the word meant to encourage others when shared can be painful to the one who, and dangerous to the one who's the messenger? We must also have a willing back. We embrace God's difficult and dangerous instruction and have willingness to experience rejection and to endure persecution. In the scripture, it's difficult to know if the servant is speaking literally or symbolically when he says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheek to those who pulled out the beard. Either way, or both ways, <laughs> he willingly accepts the opposition to the sharing of the word of God. Now, this does not mean that proclaimers of God's word should go out of their way to provoke opposition. We should not seek persecution, nor should we assume that opposition means that we are faithfully proclaiming God's word. Chief among our obligations is to speak with integrity. But if we faithfully teach and preach with integrity, opposition will likely come. We must pay a price for faithful speaking. We should pay it willingly. The more we listen, the more we'll know. The more we know, the more we'll serve. Another thing that will equip us is a determined face. The servant in this passage face has experienced pain, but he's, he still has a determined commitment. He says he sets it like flint. Our determination is based on God's helping and vindicating action. Because God is with us, we can boldly stand up against our adversaries. 
servants of God are steadfast in their determination to be faithful because they trust in God, not only because they rely on their own strength. In its original context, the words of the servant song most likely refer to the experience that the prophet is of the prophet who's proclaiming them. As the early believers grew to understand the ways Jesus fulfilled his role as Messiah and Savior, they found guidance in Second Isaiah's servant songs. Remember, Jesus died for righteousness. The prophet's experience of willing witness that leads to suffering and rejection at the hands of people, but ultimate vindication um, through the power of God, foreshadows Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Those who follow Jesus, whether clergy or laity, by God, uh, by faithfully proclaiming God's word through attitudes, words, and actions, can expect to suffer from it too, suffer for it too. Not only should we not run from the possibility, we should embrace it. In the gospel text, Mark 8, 27 through 38, Jesus tells his disciples that he is a suffering servant. When Peter objects, Jesus not only rebukes Peter, but tells both his disciples and the crowd following him that that means taking up one's cross and giving up one's life. He ends by saying, those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of the Creator with the holy angels. This brings us back to something the servant said. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. Like predecessors such as Moses, when pressed into holy service, Israel seems to show reluctance and mis and misunderstanding regarding its role before God. Despite this reluctance, the prophet projects for Israel a transcendent greatness, calling the nation into service, not only toward its own people, but toward the world's nations, the whole realm of the all-creating God, and God delivered them. So listen to God's instructions. Have a determined face when dealing with oppositions. Be a suffering servant. And know that we don't have to face it alone. God is our advocate. God is our shield. The Holy Spirit is our superhero director. With this knowledge, we too are superheroes for God. Amen.